of course, my good friend John Morgridge for convening this conference on our campus. Uh, just mingling with some of the attendees, I noticed a degree of enthusiasm and excitement about this conference, which I think has to make everybody here and everybody who organized this immensely proud. Uh, the job of, the, of being Stanford's president is certainly has to be one of the most interesting jobs of the, in the world, and you never know uh, what will occur. Uh, one of the things I think we've noticed as an institution is that we have slowly over the years migrated from a very much a California West Coast institution into an institution that serves the entire world. And I was reminded of that as we welcomed our young freshmen uh, here to campus on September 21st, just 10 days after the events of September 11th. And we were, of course, all worried because they were traveling from all over the world. And the Stanford tradition for welcoming students is that we, as they come up to their dorms, uh, our clever undergraduates, pattern match the faces of the person walking up the walk against a picture uh, directory of the entire, uh, the entire class living in that residence and greet them by first name. Uh, well, the smiles on the students' faces and the smiles on the parents at that critical time were absolutely amazing. I spent some time going around and talking to uh, various groups coming. I remember uh, one uh, parent who was bringing his child up from Los Angeles, and I asked him, well, did he fly up? And he said, yes, in a pair of F-15s. Uh, but then going around, truly the, the most moving moment for me that weekend was a reception that my wife and I host up at the president's house and all the freshmen come up. And I met a young man who came from Pakistan on September 21st to be a Stanford freshman and managed to make it around the world at that terribly difficult time and to come to be a member of our freshman class. Uh, I was absolutely thrilled because I thought not only what he would learn at Stanford would be wonderful, but how much he would contribute to the lives of all our other students would be absolutely wonderful. Um, and I asked him how the travel was, and he says, it was fine. I lost my sewing kit, my scissors, and my nail clippers, but I made it here to Stanford. And I think that's just a reminder of what a small world we now live in and perhaps why this conference is so very important. Uh, certainly the world has become a smaller place. We all have an interest in the st human condition throughout the world and ensuring that philanthropy continues and that we focus on all the important issues around the world. Uh, I'm in the middle of David McCullough's biography on Truman, uh, just through the section where he talks about the creation of the Marshall Plan. And you realize what an incredible investment the Marshall Plan was. And despite the political difficulties that they encountered in getting that through, what a difference it's made in our world. And you realize, suppose we hadn't done that, what would have happened in Europe? And I think that's something we should all remember as, as the efforts to rebuild in Afghanistan and in the Balkans and in Rwanda continue and go forward. So it is an honor to be welcoming you to this conference, I think, at a critical time for all of us, thinking about global development and about global philanthropy. I applaud your efforts to make the world a better place, and I hope that you enjoy the remainder of your program. Thank you, and please enjoy your lunch. and it's brought up a graph. I'm going the wrong way. Uh, no, it's fine. I mean, I'm technical. Thank you, President Hennessy, for joining us today. 9-11 did not change the world. The world had changed.
and 9-11 made that clear to all of us. I read with interest, and perhaps some of you may have also, uh, Mr. Scowcroft's uh, article or comments in the February 27th Wall Street Journal. And it he stated, and I quote, it is a messy world and it isn't getting better, it's probably getting worse. I'm, as an individual, far more optimistic than that. But I would agree when he said, we're just beginning to realize now that we can't prosper in a world like this. And then he quoted some statistics. In 1945, there were 51 nations that were members of the UN. On May 19th and 20th, East Timor will become the 190th UN member. You know, the old breakout in the world used to be the first world. We named it, so that's what we called it. The communist world and the third world. They didn't name it, but they might have selected a different name, I suppose. Now, instead of that kind of uh, easy to understand and fairly graphic uh, categorizing, we have kind of a mosaic of ethnic and religious, geographic, tribal uh, collage of nations. If not messy, it certainly is very complex. Forty, Forty years ago, the 20 richest countries had gross domestic products 18 times the 20 per, poorest. Today, the 20 richest are 37 times, have 37 times the gross domestic product of the 20 poorest countries. That kind of a trajectory, as we say in Silicon Valley, will not scale. Scrocroft asked the question, what to do? and answered it, actively engage, and I would paraphrase, and stay engaged in helping the world to develop a more healthy way. Just what our Nobel laureates told us last night. Within the world, people have always been on different historic clocks. Today, with globalization, these clocks increasingly are forced into some form of synchronization. From my own experience in the high-tech world, I know that time is one of the most precious assets and is very difficult to catch up on or make up on. And yet, to some degree, we're asking a lot of the cultures of the world to leap forward hundred or hundreds of years. The article raised the question whether or not technology and con communications can help to unite and balance this evolving world of ours. Many, including some in our, in our own industry, my own industry, say no. I would say I would be more generous than that. I would say that it is one of the factors, certainly, that can help. I sat in briefly on the discussion, uh, uh, the breakout session, and our experience, my experience, and the voices that I heard in that breakout were that certainly the countries of the world want to have access to and be part of this technological revolution. Our corporation has participated in a number 
of activities where we have attempted to apply technology to aid in address some of the real challenges of the world. I know many of you are familiar with NetAid. Uh, NetAid is like I think most of the world today, successful or unsuccessful based on uh, the partnerships it makes. That particular undertaking was a partnership of uh, UN, of the UN, of a, cor a private corporate, of a public corporation, Cisco, of members of the entertainment industry and individuals. And we created a worldwide network over which we broadcast one of the largest concerts in the world in an effort to obtain awareness so that we could use the network as a tool to connect donors with projects and NGOs around the world. Some of you may have visited their website. Uh, I was there when they had the birthing program on where they, in effect, uh, offered an array of products that you could purchase. I think the cheapest was about $7.50. It provided a birthing kit for a single mother. And you could go on from there to equip a village birthing setup or even a hospital, depending upon uh, uh, your ability to fund. Their current effort is focused on schools and, again, bringing together uh, NGOs, often at the country level with donors around the world, and doing that electronically. Uh, in sitting on, in on the sessions uh, today, I was not here yesterday, but today, it's very clear that many of the NGOs that are represented here from countries around the world want access, want access to uh, the giving population in this country. And certainly the network and net aid, uh, I would put forward as a vehicle to carry out that task. The other example I wanted to cite briefly is one that's very close to my heart because I've been involved in it for a long period of, ten of time and it's been very successful and we always like to be associated with successful projects. Uh, this was a case uh, where I woke up one morning as uh, CEO and of a large, of a relatively large corporation. It wasn't quite that way, but it was almost that way. We decided that we would make, we wanted to reach out into the education arena because we're a knowledge-based com company. And so we launched a program talk called Take a Router to School. Uh, And you'd be surprised how many schools wanted routers. <laughs> One of our uh, employees took me to a school where the headmaster, the father headmaster said, son, he said, I don't know what a router is, but we'll take one. <laughs> and that was the problem. Because he didn't know what a router was, how to use it, how to apply it. And uh, being a... a a challenge-oriented organization, one of our employees started a program of training people in a kind of a conventional seminar sense uh, on how to use a router, how to install it, the fundamentals of networking, how to maintain it. And then he came across the bright idea of using technology to do that training. In the spring of 1997, we did a pilot project at the Thurgood Marshall High School in San Francisco with a curriculum. Uh, at that time, we had only d developed the first uh, semester of the curriculum, first 70 hours of material. And uh, it was successful, and that fall we launched it. 
uh, schools, 67 schools raised their hand and said, we'll, we'll take your academy, we'll teach your curriculum. Uh, today there are 8,700 schools around the world that are Cisco networking academies. We have 250,000 students who are taking that curriculum in nine different languages. We've trained 30,000 teachers to teach that curriculum. The curriculum has gone from 280 hours or four semesters to 15 semesters of material covering not only networking, but the fundamentals of PC, how to uh, run a server, an understanding of Unix. We're doing Java, or Sun is, because we're partnering with a lot of folks. But it demonstrates the power of the network and of technology and its ability to reach out on a global basis and touch lives. In, 19, in the year 2000, John Chambers attended the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the global, not the global aid, what is it, the finance meeting of the, no, 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 the, uh, I'm sorry, someone knows it, GA. I'm not 70 yet, but I'm always starting. I'm already starting to have these disconnects in my computer. And he promised, he promised at that session that he would, uh, that we, uh, in conjunction with our partners, would put academies in half of the least developed uh, countries of the world. I know many of you have been to those countries. And often we look at those countries and say they have no assets. Today, we are in 37 of the 49 least developed countries of the world. We have some 1,500 students involved in our programs. And interestingly enough, those students do every bit as well on that curriculum as students throughout the rest of the world. We will be in East Timor with an academy, probably shortly after it becomes a country. And we will go back again to Afghanistan. Now, we've done this not by ourselves, but by leveraging a lot of other people's assets. We don't provide the classrooms. We don't provide the students. We don't provide the teachers, we don't provide the PCs, we don't provide the internet connections, but we provide the curriculum, we provide training, and then they do, they do it, and they do it for themselves. The lessons we've learned from this is that technology gives you a huge advantage in terms of the ability of scale and going to scale. Both the ability of scale and the ability of going to scale. It gives you great speed in terms of execution. There is no way you could have rolled out a program of that dimension uh, in a five-year period of time using the conventional approach that is taken. Uh, the students in East Timor will have the same curriculum, the same updated curriculum as the students that are taking it here in Silicon Valley. So that not only do you have the ability to provide it, but you provide it at the same level of quality. The students are tested in this program. We're a big believer in testing. We measure everything at our company, uh, even what you think of the meals. Uh, but the point is that we use the measurement not to measure, but to help the student master. Not to measure, but to master. Uh, and I think that 
education in total could learn a lot from that. Our goal is for them to master the material. And certainly the vast majority, some 50,000 now, have graduated from the first four semesters. I, the other, some of the other things we learn from this experience is that as, an ent as a corporation or as uh, 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 an uh, organization, it's important to look at all of your assets, not just your dollars. Look at all of the assets that you have, the human capital that you have, the physical capital that you have, uh, and apply it to uh, uh, the challenge in front of you. Uh, and partnering is fundamental to success. You know, you, we couldn't have done this if we'd had to build the classrooms. Partnering of business, partnering of government, partnering of the civil society. It's also important, I think, to have parallel objectives. You know, there are a lot of requests that are laid against business that I don't think are well thought out because there has to be, and particularly in terms of sustainability, there has to be some parallelism to the goal that is set. We have a need in our industry for trained technicians. It is a limiting factor on our growth. So we're interested in this program because over a period of time, there is a net positive result to us. And then I think it's important to always look to leverage assets. And certainly you're doing that at this conference. Uh, you're doing it in the form of of leveraging each other's capability. And that's what we did. We leveraged a lot of other people's assets and applied them perhaps in new and different ways. My learning from this is the importance of the three-legged stool. The fact that you have to engage government, you have to engage civil society, and you have to engage business and you have to bring them together. I'm disappointed that there wasn't more government representation at this meeting, and maybe when we see you all next year, it will be. My last contribution to this uh, meeting is to introduce my daughter, Kate Greswell. Kate? I was just about to tell him he was running into my time. <laughs> it has been very inspiring uh, to spend two days with a group of people who recognized well before September 11th that the, quote, outside world affects them and have made it their mission to affect it by working to improve the quality of life for all people. It is also inspiring to see the range of backgrounds from which you come. Uh, some of you come from the large established foundations and large NGOs, the Rockefellers and Hewlett's, the Packard's, the Cares, and Oxfam Save the Children of the World with your years of experience. And others of you are le more like myself, relatively new to the field but just as committed to service up to the level of your capacity. It's been a delight to see the linkages between those groups, and I hope those will continue. To a large extent, I think all of us share a wish for others throughout the world to enjoy the conditions most of us experience, which include, in relative terms, societal stability and civil liberty, access to quality education, a clean environment, and adequate health care, gender equity, economic opportunity, plentiful food, and clean water. We also understand that the existing and increasing disparities 
between rich and poor do not promise a stable world. One can either be a builder of bridges or a defender of them. It is a joy to be among people who are bridge builders to a world of dignity and hope. Thank you all for being here. Throughout these last two days, my attention has been captured by the information shared. I believe it speaks volumes. It is astonishing to contemplate the conditions under which most people live. It is informative to, com con to compare ourselves to others. and observe the changes over time. It is interesting to note how our foreign aid is spent. It is worthwhile to consider relative weights. It is distressing to recognize the position of women. And it is useful to reflect on what could be accomplished given the will. Unfortunately, this is just one example of many. These statistics, which we have heard over the past two days, speak for themselves. It lies in our hands to build a brighter future and to encourage others to join us. America is a nation of givers. We saw this with the outpouring of support after September 11th, with upwards of 75% of the population making some gesture of assistance. This philanthropic spirit runs deep within our country. Now we must extend its reach to all corners of the world. This is the next step we need to take. Many of the organizations that have presented to us are part of the developing infrastructure needed to make international giving easily accessible to a larger pool of donors. focusing solely on the U.S. donor element of the equation, which we know is only a portion of the puzzle. We have seen how there are emerging mechanisms to support donors in varying levels of experience. These groups are listed in your program insert and are available on the website and from the Global Philanthropy Forum. We hope that you will contact them and make use of their services in your work. Before I move on to specifics about next steps, I want to take a step which is important in all activities, and that is to say thank you. We have a lot of people to thank. <laughs> I'm not going to mention them all by name. <laughs> it was about two years ago that I joined Kavita Ramdas of the Global Fund for Women, Peter Hero of the Community Foundation Silicon Valley, and Julia Guimau, a fellow at the Hewlett Foundation, to talk about doing something to encourage international grant making. From the outset, the objective was to build a constituency and to be inclusive. And as a result, numerous people, including foundation and NGO leaders, business people, activists, and individual donors, have been involved in input sessions, in lunches, serving on working group and advisory councils, and have offered advice, helped to build audience, volunteered to travel many hours to come here to speak, to create these past two days for you. One of the joys of this undertaking has been the number of people who have sprung up to offer help. Uh, Kirk Hansen was an early springer, immediately uh, pledging Stanford's facilities for the conference. After Kirk took a position at Santa Clara University, Jim Phils of the Center of Social Innovation 
at Stanford, supported by Juliet Jurgens and Jessica Jackley, made good on Kirk's promise. Thank you, Stanford. That's Julie Jurgens. Sorry, Julie. That's Julie Jurgens. <laughs> the Hewlett Foundation also quickly leapt into action, led by the fearless Susan Bell and Paul Bress, who dared to tread where no foundation had gone before, and becoming lead sponsors of the philanthropy, Global Philanthropy Forum. Thank you, Hewlett Foundation. <laughs> they were quickly followed by other risk takers, and we were financially on our way. You can see the list of all the um, people that contributed financially. Uh, staffing was our next uh, issue as our volunteer working group started to cry mercy. And little did uh, World Affairs President Jane Wales know what her polite, if I can be of any help, please let me know, would turn into. So Jane was on the bandwagon early and quickly became the leader of the band, orchestrating the establishment of Conference Central at the World Affairs Council. The Hewlett Foundation then stepped up again, offering fellow Julia Gamont's time to the effort. And on a parallel track, the Al Norte Foundation volunteered their very talented staff mentor, Mark Ravine. Hello, Mark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to the effort. Thank you. Uh, Jane filled out the team, bringing in uh, Vivina Koyajan and the extremely capable Glenn Galish, a PhD candidate in political science, to run this effort. Glenn, with no background. <laughs> Where are you, Glenn? There's a. <laughs> uh, with no background in philanthropy or conference planning. <laughs> has, along with his dedicated team, pulled off an incredible accomplishment in building this event and laced it throughout with extreme good humor and positive energy, together with the rest of the World Affairs Council staff, Adam, Susie, Andy, Michael, Jake, June, and others. They have done an outstanding job. Thank you, World Affairs Council. And now, if your name is up on the screen, I would like you to stand up and be recognized for the giving individual that you are. Please stand up. I know there are a lot of people out there that helped. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last aside. Um, and you of the older, more established foundations, you may want to take particular note of this. Um, one innovation that TOSA is, is quite proud of is the bubble gum grant. Uh, in situations like at the Global Philanthropy Forum where the grantee may need to chew on things, uh, where you need ideas to pop into their heads, or even where there's an occasional requirement to tell somebody to go blow, excuse me. Um, you may, we, we, well, we found that this bubblegum grant is uh, very effective. And once started, however, it must be maintained throughout the program, or you may have, as was in our case, um, even the staff, the senior staff, tampering with and actually dismantling the gum machine if it breaks and the, and the, and the uh, funds run dry, the pennies run out. Just a little note for you. Um, so where do we go from here? What we have heard over the last two days um, has probably changed most of our outlooks to international grant making. And as a next step in building international grant making infrastructure, we are announcing two new programs today. These are two little next steps. The first small step is that it's our intent to build on the work of this conference and continue in partnership with the World Affairs Council. Under the Council's leadership, the Global Philanthropy Forum will work to further extend the constituencies of donors involved in international grant making by engaging with existing groups to co-host networking and informational events on international topics on a regular basis. In addition, the Global Philanthropy Forum will continue to expand and enrich its website to provide an information resource for emerging donors and links to existing programs. And finally, the Global Philanthropy Forum will plan to hold a second conference next year. 
treat. I invite you all to attend and bring your friends. <laughs> uh, we want to um, thank those of you that have returned your evaluation forms, and if you haven't, we will be strangling you at the door um, to get your input because we want uh, this to be very participatory as we've uh, work throughout this whole thing, and we really do want your input going forward on how we should structure these things. Oh, and um, Juliet and, and Glenn, Mark, and Vivina, after this, if you could please come up. I have a refill on the bubble gum and the... Um because I know you're going to need this to continue your, your work. So. The second small step, and I hope you will all be taking other steps of your, your own, um, is that I'm announcing today, in conjunction with the Tides Foundation in San Francisco, a new program. Tides will create a formal international grant-making vehicle, focusing initially on Afghanistan, to be called the International Fund for Women's Economic Empowerment. This vehicle will allow a high level of donor engagement in working to address some of the challenges that we talked about that exist in Afghanistan. And at the same time, through the support of TIDE's staff, many of the barriers to entry and implementation issues that donors face in granting overseas will be eliminated. Clearly, when we encourage international philanthropy, what we are really doing is taking what would have been U.S. tax dollars and distributing them to people outside the U.S. Is that what U.S. taxpayers want? I hope so. I hope that the current world events have made it clear to more of us that we need to begin to consider ourselves citizens of the world, that we truly begin to internalize what John Glenn did when looking down from space. From his perspective, our world has no borders. And now I think we're going to open it up for discussion. Yeah? Oh, oh. Oh, um, I, okay. Well, I, I did bring a couple people with me here today, and they seem to be wanting to come up here. So can you just take a, a quick step up here? You too. You do. And the other guy back there. Um, you know, this um, philanthropy really starts with a family. And so I brought my family. <laughs> they have something to present to Jane. Where's Jane? <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Always working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jane. <laughs> I think we have about six minutes or so um, if, if we want to do a little discussion on where we would like, or if anybody has things that they wanted to say and haven't had an opportunity. Do we have mics to go around? Or? No. Oh, I'm teasing. Once again, this I've is, got to, This you know. is Glenn. Hi. I've got, I've got to step in again. I'm sorry. We don't have time for questions. So that means you're going to have to come to next year's conference and give us a. And volunteers. 